Welcome to issue two of Air Guns in Action. And before we get on with the action, a few words about issue one. Well, it's more than a few words actually, because you sent us hundreds of letters and we thank you for them. What we found out is that we're never gonna be able to please all of the people all of the time, because what some of you want, the others don't. Hunters don't want too much field target and vice versa. What we need to do is to balance out the content of the video to suit everyone, as much as we can anyway. We're gonna keep on doing that, we'll work towards it, but it will be governed by your input and your opinions. So keep those letters flowing, please, because with your influence and your support, we can make air guns in action everything we all want it to be. So let's get on with the action and the first feature. And I'm going to build myself a pigeon hide. The place I've chosen is precisely here because it has a nice solid background. And that's very important because what you don't want to, is for the birds to be able to see you moving behind chinks of light. It's quite overcast today, but uh, if it was sunny, the sun would be strong behind. And as soon as I moved, they would see me. So a nice solid background, that is the basis for all good hides. Got my bamboos here, my old bit of uh, trawl net. I much prefer a bit of net like this because I can rig it to precisely the right shape I would need and use the local vegetation as camouflage. The trouble with uh, nets that already got camouflage scrim on them is that you normally have to camouflage the camouflage because they're the wrong colour. But first of all, I'm going to make this, make a place to, to, to hide myself in without disturbing this background vegetation. So I'll go in over here. Start with the secateurs and find myself a way through. The thing is to disturb as little vegetation as possible. And all this lovely clump of nettles here will be used for thickening up the net. And this is where This hide isn't just for wood pigeons, it's for rooks as well. And rooks have got extremely sharp eyesight. If you can build a hide that fools rooks, you'll fool anything. As I say, anything that looks like being part of the front, don't move it. Anything that sticks in your ear, cut it off. The hide's going to be from here to here. That's about six foot wide. And we've got a lovely roof over the top of these overhanging branches so the birds can't fly over and look down and see me hiding in here. First thing I'm going to do is empty out these decoys. Because I reckon it's important to <coughs> put the hide, uh, put the seat in the hide before starting to build it. It makes life much easier. You don't have to tear the hide apart to get the seat in. No, I'll just drop down there that down there for the moment. One of the advantages of using bamboo poles is A, I can get them off the farmer for free, and B, I can just weave them into this fence here and tuck them in the soil because the, the ground is very hard. That's gone in, oh, oh, three, four inches. Another thing is I can just, I can leave the hide here. Nobody's going to come and see, oh, wonderful poles, I'll steal them. Stop the old net flapping around. 
tie it to the fence. That's another reason why I hate these camouflage nets. They flap and rustle like crazy. Let's keep it tidy. This is the scaffolding on which the hide is built. This bit this is my door. And just hang over there. Now just weaving in some vegetation here to camouflage the net and thicken it up and make it look like a perfectly natural extension of the hedgerow. Which of course it is, give or take a bit of trawl net. It really is worth taking time doing this. Because you can leave the hide for a week or two. And all you've got to do is come back and thicken it up a bit more. In fact, I've leave, I often leave them for a year or more. As I build this hide, I, I start at the top. It's like thatching. You get a nice thick layer up the top, then uh, cover up the stems of that layer, then work down and cover up the stems of the middle layer. And at the bottom, you just put some grass, old bits of stubble, um, a few thistles, anything, old dry grass. It just finishes off, makes the thing look like it's just grown out of the hedgerow perfectly natural. The net needs to be properly supported because it has to take quite a weight of vegetation. Although having said that, by the time you've woven in all these thick thistle stems, it does stiffen it up quite a lot. There's one thing you'll notice about this hide, it doesn't flap around in the wind. Well, this is my hole for shooting through. I've got a nice solid hide. Well, I don't think the crows, magpies, Pigeons or rooks will see me inside here. Prometheus gives shooters the ability to discover their true potential. Prometheus, the world leader without being led. We've come down to Bisley, the home of all types of shooting to investigate the practical possibilities of rapid-fire air guns. We've got four models to display. We've got the Theoban Rapid 7, the Scan Mini Bullpup, we've got the Falcon Pneumatic, and for all you spring gun enthusiasts, there's the BSA Gold Star. First up, the Theoban Rapid 7. Here it is. Some people like the looks of it, others don't. It's a bottle reservoir gun, detachable reservoir, magazine fed, bolt action, heavily silenced with a two-stage silencer, and they need to be. All pre-charged guns make a hell of a racket if you don't have a silencer on them. The magazine is a clockwork affair, seven shot clip. You load seven pellets in there, tension the spring as you go, insert it, clip it home, and you're ready to go. There's no real problem in loading the magazine. It's fairly easy. What you want to know is, how does she work? Well, let's give it a go. Well, that weren't bad, five out of six, plus a lucky squirrel. Now those targets were between 10 and 28 yards away, which is sort of normal hunting ranges. The little red spot on my magazine tells me that I've got one pellet left, and I'm gonna use it for that stinking rabbit I missed in the first run. Gotcha. The Rapid 7 system gives you a few options. You can have a Tyrolean walnut stock. You can have the larger bottle, and I'd advise you to go for that. The 300 mil gives you loads more shots. This one's got a two-stage silencer on it, which has been superseded by the Evolution, which is a smoother unit, slightly more efficient, good-looking unit. Otherwise, what you're looking at is a very efficient hunting machine. And for all the right reasons, it's got itself a hell of a fan club.
When you're talking about fast fire air guns, they don't fire any faster than the Scan Mini Bullpup. This one's the top of the range model with the lovely walnut furniture. And it is nice, feels warm on your face. It's much better than the, the metal of the extrusion here. This is a pretty little gun now. It used to have all sorts of screw heads and bolts and things on it. But Mike Charles, the designer, has cleaned it all up. And I think she looks the part. It's got a single stage trigger because there's no point in having a two stage unit on such a fast handling machine as this. Pellets are arranged in line, nose to tail, in a series of chambers. You index them by hand, and in the case of FT Trophy pellets, it'll give you 12 per chamber. When they're finished, you release the cocking slide, rotate the chamber by hand, put the cocking slide back, and away it'll go. It'll, the plunger will push them into this carrier, the carrier delivers them to the breech, and away they go faster than you can aim and pull the trigger. Oh, believe me, you'll see that, but you'll be amazed when you do. The whole thing is very strong, very purposeful looking, and is actioned on this sliding forend here. What you really need to do is see it work. Let's give it a run. Right, 12 shots gone there, and if I do say so myself, that was fairly efficient shooting. What I need to do now is pull the slide back, index the magazine by hand, let the slide forward, and I'm ready for another 12. Now I'm gonna rattle these off as fast as this little gun will allow me to do it. Without aiming, I'll probably shoot them into the ground just to show you just how fast it is. What you do have to remember with this little thing is that all these pellets need to be perfect. It's so important. Now, this rifle is far more accurate than I've just shown you. It did okay, but if it was fired deliberately, as it always should be against live quarry, it will give you very, very credible groups. Probably a lot better than I can do them. Anyway, just watch this. Watch how fast it is. Right, that's how far she is. Let's see what you've got to do to maintain it. Well, it's filled by this little cylinder here, which screws into the valve at the back. No problem in filling it, very simple. You just screw it into a keeper on the bottle and recharge it. Screw it back into the gun, lock it off. What you do need to remember is that the cylinder will be empty before the magazine. So you'll need to take a spare with you if you're going to shoot loads and loads of pellets. Depending on the efficiency of your pellet, I've been getting between 35 and 50 shots per cylinder. But they're so small, you'll be able to carry two. It's not going to be a problem for you. This is another anything but cheap and cheerful rifle, but it's very well made. And its potential for sheer shooting enjoyment is probably unmatched. Superb little gun. You can see why they're so popular. Not only a spring gun, but a spring gun without a telescopic sight on it. The BSA Gold Star was the only one of the four rifles on test that had open sights, so I thought I'd use them. Now it has got a wonderful scope rail, it's got the BSA Maxi Grip scope rail there, with a cushioned job with some rubber underneath to absorb vibration. But I thought I can still do it with a set of open sights. Let's see if I was lying.
and once again the rabbit gets away with it but uh, when you rewind this you'll notice that the two shots I hit him with landed on top of each other not bad for open sights how does it all work fairly simple it's a magazine system which relies on a little casement to index 10 pellets which are loaded by a prod activated by the underlever. Very simple, no external power source, good old spring piston and very accurate indeed. This rifle comes with a screw in front mount for a BSA silencer which does work very well, very light, doesn't affect it at all and it's a very punchy, direct, accurate rifle came out very well in deliberate tests actually it really did the thing to remember is don't get the magazine dirty if you drop it in the mud put it in your pocket and put a spare in don't introduce grit to this system or you can wreck it as always select your pellets keep them clean keep the rifle clean and use it properly it's a good system simple reliable and rugged I like it Finally, a lightweight two-shot sporter from Falcon. It's a pneumatic design and it has a pelleting weighting clip. You have one up the spout and one retained by this little spring clip here, which will drop into the chamber as I action the bolt. Now, two shots doesn't compare to the scan, the Theoban or the BSA, but remember, hunting is supposed to be a one-shot business. So this little gun gives you twice as much as you're supposed to need. I'm going to direct both of my shots to my friend, the rabbit. Let's see how I get on. Draw back the bolt to cock the gun. One in the head to show him who's boss. Bring it down. Reload. Cock it again. One in the heart to knock him over. There you go. A rabbit never was much of a match for a decent falcon and this is a decent falcon as you can see pretty little gun very lightweight nice touches of brass here contrast with the blue an important thing to remember with this is that you can remove the two shot clip if you want to go back to single shot action moving towards the muzzle is another good feature the charging inlet has a sliding cover over it it's a whip charger very thin lead plug it into there fill the gun pull it off, slide the charger cover over, keep the grid out. This one has an optional silencer too, which works very well and I would recommend it. Overall, for smaller shooters or lady shooters or people who just don't like heavy guns, this little thing is well worth considering. It's also got a sliding butt pad, which gives away its field target pedigree. Extremely accurate, very affordable. Take a close look at this little Falcon. So, what have we learned from our little exploration into the world of fast fire air guns? Well, for a start, I've learned that the more you find out, the more complicated your choice becomes. And I've also found out that if we were to go into the pros and cons of every fast fire system, we'd need two hours worth of video and we wouldn't be able to cover another subject. So let's see what we did on Earth. Well, the Rapid 7, that shaded the deliberate accuracy tests, with the Falcon not far behind. Also, you get the most shots per charge from the Rapid 7. Then the BSA, which is the, by far the cheapest, that gives you independence. You don't rely on an outside power source. You've got your old bicep and springs and pistons. That's all you need. The scan, by far the quickest. That gives you buckets of shots faster than you can aim them properly. Then there's the Falcon, by far the lightest and probably the handiest little rifle of the lot, which can also be changed back to single shot formula. So overall, you've got to examine all the features, see what they offer you, and see what you need to do with them. There's one other aspect I've left out. 
The first is serious. All these rifles were not designed to enable you to hose down quarry with streams of inaccurate lead. Hunting is still a one-shot business and must remain so. And the other thing is fun. The fun you can have with these things is unbelievable. Look at this. That's a whole magazine from the scan, 20 yards, fast as I could fire it, and few probably went off the target. But the fun I had doing it was absolutely unbelievable. And that's what air gun shooting's all about. Shooting enjoyment, responsible fun. You pay your money, you take your choice. How do expert shooters do what some of us only dream about? They learn their trade from the ground up. Nothing is left to chance. Experts study the systems of success, from trigger to muzzle. They research the art of rangefinding and trajectory, and they do all this safely and effectively. Now you can become an expert because you'll have no excuses. In the last issue, we showed you shooting pellets into gelatin to catch them in mid-flight. And we then said that we would fly these in the pellet flyer. Now this is the pellet flyer. At the bottom, there is the variable transformer, which controls the speed of the old vacuum cleaner, which forms the basis of the machine. The vacuum cleaner drives the air upwards through the tubes and the top tube, the plastic one, is bored with a taper. The Diabolo stabilised pellet relies on its shape to support it on the rising current of air coming up from the vacuum cleaner. It's stabilised in the same manner as a badminton shuttlecock, which always flies nose forward held straight by the weight at its nose and the airflow over its tail feathers. This is in opposition to the spin stabilized pellet, which has no Diablo shape at all, more of a bullet shape and relies totally for its stabilization on the spin imparted to it by the rifling in the barrel. I'll now turn the machine on and put a pellet into it which has come straight from the tin, in other words, a brand new undamaged pellet. Well, that completes the tests and the results are much as we expected. But it must be remembered that this is not a complete picture of a pellet's performance because they're not spun in this tube. But they do very clearly show the difference between a pellet which has been fired and one which has been not been fired. And this is especially so in the case of a pellet that's been fired in an over powerful rifle. And here is one of those pellets now, and we will show you what happens in the tube. We've now seen just one facet of a pellet's characteristics. To examine them all would take forever because there are very, very many of them. It is now up to you, the shooter, to go and collect together as many possible brands of pellet as you can and try them all in your gun so that you can then establish the pellet 
which best suits your rifle, your barrel, and your shooting conditions. This is the Tasco 10x42SS, one of their new military style scopes. Basically, it's a fixed 10 mag with a 30mm body tube, 42mm front lens. I tested a prototype version of this about 18 months ago, and since then they've made two major changes. They've shifted the focal mechanism from here, which was quite awkward, to here on the side, and it works very smoothly. They've also altered the size of the turret locking screws. These used to be small and deeply recessed. Now they're big chunky jobs, quite near the surface and easy to get a key into and re-zero. One suggestion I would make is for Tasco to consider fitting or supplying a sunshade. The front lens is very close to the edge of the cowling of the scope and you could have problems with glare. The scope body is threaded to take one, so perhaps they should consider it. It's focused for setup by the shooter from the back end. You have a big rubber ring around here to protect your eye and to give you a good handful of ring to move. Once that's set up, I don't expect that to move. Same with the windage and elevation turrets. Although you can't lock them off, I can't see any branch or piece of debris ever knocking that around. That'll only move if you want it to. The numbers are very large and if it has moved away from zero, you'll certainly be able to see it. The overall construction of this scope is practically faultless. It's developed alongside military lines and has been dropped out of helicopters, frozen in the Arctic Ocean, dragged through deserts, all sorts of things. Lens quality is superb. It's got a novel type of crosshair. It's got a thick post, thin crosshair configuration with four index dots on each axis. Very usable, very serviceable scope indeed. Its 10 mag is a little bit low for target use and some would say a bit high for hunting use. But in a deliberate situation, like from a hide, or from a stalking situation where you know the ground and you know where your quarry is likely to be, I don't think this scope could be bettered. If you have SS money and a job for the SS scope to do, I suggest you seriously look at it, or better still, look through it. We've come down to Sussex to see air arms, one of the success stories of the modern air gun industry. So Bill, how long has this company been involved in air guns? Well, so I understand it. Uh, we entered into the field of air, uh, the air gun scene in the year of 1977. And were you new to the company then? I was new to the company, yes I was. What prompted air arms move into the area of high performance air guns? Well, with the indication of, of how they actually fared with their side lever rifles, they felt that the natural progression would be into the new lines that we then embarked upon. Colin, Air Arms are obviously committed to high technology. What was so wrong with the old ways of manufacture then? By spending a lot of money on machines, we can produce an accurate, precise component time after time. Um, You've seen our, our latest acquisition, which is the horizontal machine, the pallet change machine that, uh, that makes the RN10 bodies and a few other components. That's even got in-process checking on the machine. And part of the program is that when it machines a face, the, pro it, the face is probed, and if it's out of limit or the limit has changed, it will alter the machine automatically. So the next one that comes along goes back onto nominal size rather than being above or below the limits the, that we allow. It's almost impossible to get that kind of repeatability in terms of accuracy and production times without high technology machines. In fact, I would say it is impossible. The highest of the high tech machines, as far as I'm concerned, is that laser cutter. What does that do for you? It gives us in-house capacity to produce sheet metal components very, very accurately. Uh, the laser cuts has got the same kind of accuracy in terms of movement, axis movement, as our milling machines. Um, and it means, basically, that we can flame cut, because it is it's heat cut, it's not flame cut, but we can 
heat cut materials with almost the accuracy that we can mill them. But when you mill or turn uh, soft materials, we, you have problems of deburring and finishing, which you don't get on the laser. What sort of test procedures do air arms insist on for their air rifles? Well, be before the mechanism even gets put into a stock, it's fired quite considerably. This has a two-fold advantage. One, it's, it is quite possible for a rifle to be assembled and you'll fire it 20 or 30 times and, and no fault, if I can call it that, will show up. But over that, any small thing that's been forgotten by the people that assemble it or whatever will show up. Secondly, rifles do change. Their characteristics change after they've been fired. We, I would like to fire a rifle for a thousand shots, two thousand shots, before we put it in a box. That, unfortunately, is impractical. No, nobody would be prepared to pay for, for the time involved in doing that. The RN10 takes the lion's share of all of our efforts at the moment, mainly because it's a new rifle. We are still learning about it, and we have spent quite a bit of money extra money to check the RN10 the way it should be checked. I think you've seen that in respect of our computerised chronograph. That was brought mainly because we needed um, a record, something that we record every shot, not just the first, second, the 20th or whatever. And we could go back a week later or months later, check those results against what when that was now being achieved, and just check that everything was going okay. The RN10 project, is, it has huge potential. How far can this system go? Well, I'd like to see, but this is just a, a personal thing, but I certainly would like to see that we reach the, the situation where we have gold medals coming from this, and I'm talking Olympic gold medals. But uh, whether that's a bit far removed, I don't know, but we'd love to see that happen. Colin, as the main designer for Air Arms, how do you feel about how your products have gone and how they've been received by the public? Um, I think that we've done pretty well, to be quite honest. Um, certainly the impetus for the change in design and our what has been a fairly rapid change from uh, spring rifles, a standard reasonably priced spring rifle to the, to the upper section of, of shooting, has been uh, because of the... Um, whims of Bill Sanders. Well, you're the man to ask, Bill. What's coming out of the Air Arms factories that we don't know about yet? Oh, that, now that would be telling, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, come on, then tell us. Um, well, we have on, on the drawing board at, at uh, this present moment areas that we're looking into on a spring rifle. And indeed, certainly, there's new things afloat as regards the pneumatic. But that's as far as I'm going to prepare to say. Well, you've always done well in this marketplace, and I, I consider you will. Well, that's it from Air Arms, but keep your eyes peeled for my review of the RN10. Looks like it's going to be a bit special. Targetronics Chronos are at the forefront of technology. Our Chronos are used by everyone, from top manufacturers to airgun enthusiasts. To find out why, call our information hotline now. I have here the latest rifle from Theoban Engineering, the Taunus, and it is a very sw sweet rifle. I've been playing with it before I came on air, so to speak. It features Theoban's well-known gas ram system, which produces very little recoil. It's uh, a very short barrel, only seven inches, with an evolution silencer, but it's quite easy to cock. As you can see, it has a very slim forend, and that is to save weight. And I must say, it balances very sweetly. But obviously, the checkering is slightly raised, so you get a perfect grip when you're sh shooting with it. Coming back down here, we have, firstly, the scope rail here, which is part of the rifle itself. It's an integral part of the rifle. And these mounts for the scope are designed by Theobin to complement this ramp. And the result is that the scope stays very firmly nailed to the rifle, and there's absolutely no chance of it moving around. 
The trigger is adjustable, but uh, to be quite honest, I don't think there's any need to adjust it because when I've been firing it just now, the trigger pull was totally, I, ju I just didn't notice it. I was on target, on aim, just gave the trigger, trigger a slight little pressure and off went the pellet. Now, at the back of the here, we have a nice little groove to put the thumb in a beautifully contoured pistol grip and a very sweet little cheek piece here which makes the stock very easy to mount precisely into your cheek and it comes up a treat. Yes, it does come up to the shoulder very nicely and sits very sweetly in the cheek. In its present version, complete with the Evolution silencer and this scope, it costs around £550. Otherwise, it's about £430. And I think we ought to go and shoot something with it. I'm just going to see if I can have a go at that tin can out there. Now I think that this is an automatic safety on this gun. What we do is just push it off forwards and you're ready for action. Well, I left the camera crew to mess around with their kit and went for a walk down the hedge and I met this gentleman here. One nice plump bunny, just ready for the stew pot. Tasco, the world's number one best-selling range of rifle scopes, is available from Deben. Deben, our aim is your satisfaction. Ask any untrained shooter to sit down and shoot a rifle, and nine times out of ten, this is how he'll do it. So what's wrong with that? Well, just about everything, actually. He's got his shooting position based on bony elbows against bony knees. Absolutely the worst as far as stability goes. Give him a tiny little prod, put a bit of adrenaline through the muscles that are supporting the whole thing, and the position falls apart. What he needs to do is to use his bones instead of his muscles. Here's how he does it. You bring the rifle over the knee. That's the main support. You let it sit on the pad of the arm, the left hand for right-handed shooters doesn't support it at all. You just rest it over the right. The right hand controls the trigger and the whole structure sits over the knees, shooter leaning slightly forward and promoting stability from a three-point stance. Weight through the bones into the ground. Now, if I was to put downward pressure on here, a load of it, more than he could handle anyway, the position would still take it without breaking up. There's a variation on this theme that a lot of field target shooters use and that's when the rifle is still supported on the knee but it's held with the hand. This is best with a target glove. Again the system is supported on the knees or slightly lower but we're not relying on muscle power we're using the bones. If we change position the whole thing can be walked around and the target position can be achieved. If you want to lower the rifle, you pull down the front leg. If you want to raise it, you pull it towards you. You don't twist at the torso. There's a great reason for hunters to achieve this position, because if they can get it and use it, it's the finest position to zero your gun from, and everything comes from a good zero, as you know. It's no coincidence that all successful field target shooters use this position or a version of it and they are successful enough to know that you transfer the principles to the standing and kneeling shots. So let's try that. Again, it's all about support. We don't have as much of it in the kneeling position, but we make use of what we've got. 
shorten the support for the rifle on the left hand, hold it under there. Don't put the elbow back on the knee. We learned about that in a sitting position. Get the rifle into the shoulder. Now, here's where you find out whether you want to hit the target or you want to keep your trousers clean. If you put the beanbag under your knee, it will keep your knee clean, but it won't support the stance. What you do is you pull it back, you put your knee in the dirt, and you let the beanbag support the instep. Far more comfortable, far more efficient. You just up the laundry bills a bit. Okay, now look down the scope. Again, a target glove would help. You adjust the position on the front foot and fire from there. You will have to fine tune it yourself because each person's body shape is different. But again, the principles are the same. The point of balance of the rifle is just forward of the trigger guard, going through the knee into the ground via the shortest prop possible, your forearm. Okay? Now, when it comes to standing position, well, support really is at a premium, but we can still make use of what there is. Same thing. Here's the hunting stance. Forward, arms, muscles, not really very efficient. We go for more of a, of a target principle for field target shooting. Support the arm into the hip, stick the hip forward. Let the, most of the weight go through the rifle, into the hip, into the ground. The back foot is for stability only. Okay, so apply that. The less strain you have on the supporting arm here, the more control you'll have over the trigger. Again, you will fine tune it to your own requirements, but it's remembering principles rather than copying this particular stance. Bones, not muscle. Stability, not point and pull. This is an air gun, not a shotgun. Theoban Engineering, developers of the gas ram system, now bring you the new Fenman and Taunus rifles. For an information pack on these and the rest of the range, just send a stamped addressed envelope to Theoban. To fully understand all the lubrication needs of an air rifle takes many years of practice. What we need to learn is basic lubrication between services. For general cleaning and rust protection, use a cloth impregnated with silicon oil and simply wipe it over the gun. For metal to metal, the rule couldn't be simpler. Grease for the big bits, oil for the small bits. And remember, only use quality lubricants. Oil the pivot pins. Use about two drops a month, but you must use it sparingly. Use grease on breech faces, cocking slides and dab very small amounts from a cotton bud between the coils of the mainspring. Only use a very thin film so it won't attract and hold grit. Those are the do's, now here are the don'ts. Never put any type of lubrication down the transfer port. The only thing that should go down there is air. And never use silicon oil to lubricate, use it only as a protector. And don't spray it directly onto the gun. Spray it on a cloth and then wipe it over. It takes only 10 minutes a month to keep your air gun properly lubricated. It costs only a few pence and it can save you pounds in the long run. So make sure you do it. This is the new age of air rifles from Air Arms. Every component is produced by skilled staff using the latest laser and computer controlled technology. All Air Arms rifles are individually tested to ensure peak performance. Air Arms, the best sporting air rifles in the world. And that's guaranteed. My last visit to the Air Arms factory was fairly productive. I came away with an RN10 and one of these. You won't have seen this yet because it's not out. This is the new pre-production prototype air arms rifle, codename Tomahawk. I think Tomahawk's a great name because it describes something that's short and punchy and quite effective. I don't think air arms like it. They like to stick to letters and numbers and stuff like that. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's a Tomahawk. What you're looking at is basic TX technology. We have the same power plant at the moment with a few internal modifications that air arms won't let me tell you about. We have the same safety mechanism, which basically locks into the piston shroud here. The same superb trigger unit and the same manual safety there. The real difference, of course, is at the front end. This fat bull barrel isn't the barrel at all, it's the shroud, the barrel's inside it. What it does do is not only give it a carbine chunky effect, but it acts as a sound moderator because the barrel ends there and the expanded air bounces around inside here until the majority of the noise is used up. What it means is that the TX underlever has been shortened. 
it gives it a slightly stiffer feel although with the ratchet system working you can actually take a rest between pulls there's no great effort to it it's very precise again you can decock it if you're careful like that you get the same pellet feed assistance from the protruding breech there and the whole thing snaps together extremely well you can see how stylish the thing is and I've shot it with a three or four different types of pellets and it really does work well now this is a very stylish little package and the style won't be terribly improved by this thing now this is an optional silencer air arms are intending to produce they've threaded the muzzle of this little tomahawk to accept it it's got a very long thread travel so I won't screw it in now doesn't do anything for the looks of the gun but my god it does silence the shot it's a very very effective piece of equipment looking down it you can see there's all sorts of baffles and holes and stuff like that to give the air the run around as it stands and whatever they call it air arms have come up with another great little sporter we'll be doing a full review of the tomahawk when we get a production model and you'll see the rn10 in the next video but for now forget the rifle just concentrate on this bit here's another new gadget from theoban what it is is a spirit level and you have a standard rifle scope ring here which instead of clamping onto the rifle clamps on to a little plastic body which holds a bubble now any movement at all of the rifle and you'll see that big bubble there gives away the fact that you're canting the gun the clever thing is they've surrounded the spirit level with a large expanse of black plastic which acts as an occluder as a blanking screen and by the miracle of optics transfers it to your field of view through the scope as long as you shoot with both eyes open it's ever so simple it unscrews you can take it off for easy transportation so as it doesn't poke a hole in your gun bag and it costs about 23 pounds I've been using this for the last two months and it's extremely effective it becomes part of your shooting routine and you do it with absolutely no thought for it whatsoever it gets itself into your subconscious excellent piece of kit one I would thoroughly recommend another recommendation also simple like the best ideas is this thing this thing's your basic see-through mount you put the scope in the rings as per normal but because it's got a hollow section you can also use the open sights of your gun this comes from pro mount it also has the new flat top which they made me balance a coin on for 39 seconds once not as easy as it looks the mounts are strong very strong indeed and they're tensioned by some hex headed bolts here again the simple things in life are usually the best and the news just in sportsmatch have just announced they will no longer be producing the gc2 and scimitar air rifles john ford the owner and co-inventor of the GC2 feels he has achieved his objective in producing the world's finest sporting air rifle and will now concentrate his company's resources on the equally successful scope mounts and accessories. In a year which saw the GC2 take the European field target title, together with the world's senior and junior title, who can argue John hasn't fulfilled his dreams? News as it breaks, air guns in action. Here's something you're not going to see very often, I promise you. Terry Doe doing a hunting piece. This isn't hunting really, this is vermin control. And the only reason I'm doing it is because it threatens the life's work of someone who is pretty special. I'm at the National Swan Sanctuary at Egham and its founder, Doc Beeson, has asked me to come in and take care of a rodent problem. I come here twice a week and I think we've got the problem under control. We don't see that many. What I'll be using is a Theoban Rapid 7, which Theoban backed the power off for me. I've got a Simmons Whitetail Classic scope with coated optics to maximise light. And I've got a Deben Tracer Compact Light, which has an essential variable light control on it. Now normally, I'll be using a red filter on this thing to diffuse the light so as not to spook the rats. We're under the flight path of Heathrow and we're within earshot of the M3 and M25 motorways. It's not sound that frightens these rats, it's light. But so I can show you and the cameraman what's going on, I'm going to have to use this little compact at full power. It may spook the rats, I may not get a shot. We'll have to give it our best go. 
Right. Let's get to it. They haven't really settled down tonight. It's a full moon and they seem pretty freaky. Can you see the spilled grain? That's paradise for the rats. They got fresh water and once they got under that concrete, it's really hard to dislodge them. There's not many here now. We thinned them out severely, but the ones that are here are considering staying, I think. They can't really blame them. Problem. These things are so strong. But he still moved five yards before he died. They are strong animals. He's down. No, he's in there, he's in that rock. Somewhere, no, that is a big rat. That is a big rat, I'd like a go at him. He's around. He's still behind that rock. There's a big one a long way away. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was what we call a miss. It's a clean miss though, and that's uh, better than wounding him. There's one there, I can just see his eyes. One eye, not clear enough for a shot. I took my father around here a couple of weeks back. He's an old countryman and uh, he's not got the same sort of regard for the clean death of a rat that I have. He was fairly disgusted with me actually. He said, uh, if you can see its back leg, shoot it. It's gonna die, it's only a question of time. No, we don't do it that way. leave this area fairly well undisturbed. I'd like to come back for that big one. There aren't many around here and uh, I'd like to get him. The reason I don't take many long shots is because uh, I zero this thing at eight yards, which effectively gives it a downrange zero of about 47. So uh, a 25 yard shot needs two inches of hold under very hard to judge, especially at night. I don't like to take chances. There's too many things around I don't want to hit. Right, there's one right next to the fence. Now that's how they should go. Stone dead, one shot, straight through the head. It's a shame they don't all die like that. There's another one running. If he stops, he's dead. There he goes. He'll be back. Now here's the problem. We have feeder bins here. Got the edge of the water here, normally very popular. One shot bouncing off the water. Look how many necks and eyeballs and stuff there are in the way of it. You see, for every shot I can take, there's normally about four or five that I can't. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go and pick up the two dead ones. I'll show you how you handle a rat, whether he's, a, he's been dead for a week or five minutes. They're still very dangerous animals, even when they're dead. Now, some people will tell you to put a pellet in, in a rat at point blank range, just to make sure. Well, I don't. And the reason I don't is that if you do that, you can get a splashback of blood or urine, and it can come on your face if you do that at point blank. Also, you don't know if he's laying on a stone or whatever, you, can have, you get a pellet bounce back in your eye. Now, I can see that animal is dead, he's safe, so I'll approach him and pick him up. You'll notice I always use gloves. I wear gloves from the minute I start to shoot the rats to when I leave them. But you can't be too safe. You could have an open cut or anything. When you shoot a rat, he normally will give off urine or blood that could be infected with Viles disease. There's no way back from Viles disease. Once you've got it, I don't think anybody's ever recovered and I don't want to take the chance. Everybody may think this is a little bit over the top, but uh, I'd rather be safe than sorry.
Well, I've been up all night and uh, so is the film crew. And we're out first thing in the morning filming uh, issue three. So uh, as we say in Tellyland, I think that's a wrap. I never did get that really big one by the rockery, but I'm coming back in a couple of days and uh, I reckon he'll be here to meet me. I don't suppose I'll ever recapture the buzz I used to get when I was hunting with air guns four, five days a week and most nights as well. But that's been replaced by a feeling of satisfaction at helping out the good people here. And uh, what I hope is a, a step towards forming a working relationship with this internationally acknowledged conservation body. It just feels good to do a, a bit of good with these air guns and show the people that when they're used properly, they can be good things to have around. Right, that's it for issue two. Before I say goodbye, I'd like to thank you for your interest in issue one. Please keep the letters coming and I'll leave you with a few clips of what's coming up in issue three. See you soon. <laughs>